Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the webinar, Addressing Health Disparities in Underserved Population. I'm Dan Festerman with Community Health Improvement Partners and Director of the San Diego County Childhood Obesity Initiative, also affectionately known as the COI. The COI has a mission to reduce and prevent childhood obesity by advancing policy, systems, and environmental change through the use of the collective impact model. The COI is a program of Live Well San Diego Healthy Works and implemented by Community Health Improvement Partners. This work supports Live Well San Diego, the county vision for a region that is building better health, living safely, and thriving. As a bit of brief background uh, for the webinar, in 2017, the COI released the State of Childhood Obesity Report in, for San Diego County. The data from that report suggests that the rate of Hispanic Latino students affected by obesity in fifth, seventh, and ninth grade is over twice that of their non-Hispanic classmates. Knowing that Hispanic Latino children make up approximately half of all public school students in San Diego County makes these findings all the more significant. So while we certainly acknowledge that health disparities affect many communities, whether by gender, race, or class, the COI has identified addressing health disparities affecting the Hispanic Latino community as a priority, which is the emphasis for creating this webinar. We hope that this webinar will provide you with a better understanding of health disparities, specifically as they relate to childhood obesity and the Hispanic Latino population, as well as policies and practices that can help reduce those health disparities and improve health outcomes for reducing childhood obesity. The first presenter will be Sandra Vieira. Sandra is a graduate of the University of San Francisco with a master's degree in public administration and policy, and she earned her bachelor's degree in political sciences from California State University, Long Beach. She joined the Prevention Institute in 2010, working to promote safe and healthy communities through projects focused on improving the built environment and increasing equitable opportunities for physical activity and play. Sandra has provided support to the Healthy Places Coalition, a statewide coalition that's seeking to advance public health involvement in land use and transportation planning, as well as the Joint Use Statewide Task Force whose mission is to increase community access to playgrounds through the policy of joint use agreements between school districts and local government. As a program manager, Sandra serves as the lead trainer for the organization in the areas of community engagement, stakeholder engagement, coalition building, and cross-sectoral collaboration to audiences that include nonprofits, government agencies, and grant-making foundations. Prior to joining the Prevention Institute, Sandra served as the Associate Director of Policy at Latino Health Access, which is a nonprofit based in Santa Ana, California, where she coordinated multi-sector, long-term healthy eating and active living initiatives focused on changing policy, systems, and environmental change. Sandra will provide an overview of health equity and the Thrive Framework the Prevention Institute promotes to enable communities to determine how to improve health and safety and promote health equity. Welcome, Sandra. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so, so nice to get to be here today, and um, I really appreciate the invitation to be part of um, a panel of, of great speakers. I'm looking forward to learning myself from, from the folks that are joining us today. And I just want to recognize, um, you know, as, as someone who has been working on chronic disease prevention and health equity now um, for, for over 10 years, I know there's so much exciting work and progress and accomplishments that have happened um, in, in and across San Diego County. And so just really want to acknowledge um, that level of expertise and um, insight that so many folks on, on the call um, today uh, bring. And I hope we have um, time at the end to be able to, to surface that and to tap into that. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm Sandra Vieira. I'm an Associate Program Director at Prevention Institute. And for those who may not be familiar, Prevention Institute is a national nonprofit. We are headquartered in Oakland, and we have been since um, our inception 20, just over 20 years ago. Um, in recent years, we have also opened a, a physical office in South Los Angeles. And as we think about you know, health inequities and disparities, um, that uh, particular location was, was a very intentional um, sort of approach that we took on because we wanted to be uh, anchored and centered in a community that was experiencing the disparities in health and safety um, as well as health inequities 
um, because it's, it's important for us to, to be part of the communities that we work with, for, and alongside. And I know many of you are coming from that, that same place. As our name might um, give away, our focus is on prevention and primary prevention at that. We're really focused on thinking and acting on the strategies that prevent people and communities from getting sick and injured in the first place. That is our main call to action, and we partner with a number of different uh, groups, government agencies, philanthropies, researchers, to really get to the root of uh, poor health and inequity, um, all in the effort to change norms around health and safety. So just as a bit of a, of a refresher, when um, I, I think about norms, when I talk about norms, I'm really referring to the attitudes, beliefs, ways of thinking that guide our behavior and activity. They're oftentimes taken for granted because they're in some ways invisible. Um, if, you, if you travel around um, you know, the, the world, you, you start to kind of see how different cultures, societies, you know, really have, have different norms around, for example, commuting and driving or, you know, eating and cultivating food. Um, and that's the same in our communities, you know, across the country and also uh, in California. Um, they're behavior shapers, uh, what we sort of expect and put out there as expectations for people's, you know, behaviors and actions um, really shape um, how kids, young people, older people um, are, are able to live, you know, their lives. And they sanction behavior. They really kind of uh, put out there what is acceptable uh, and encourageable behavior. And they're oftentimes based in culture and tradition. So norms are incredibly powerful uh, in either promoting health and safety or limiting health and safety. And I know groups uh, and, and partners and members of the um, Obesity Prevention Initiative are, are really focused on changing norms so that health and, and healthy options are, in fact, the default option. Now, history in, in primary prevention and on these sort of norms change um, is all around us. And I think if we look to see how things have changed in the last 20, 30, 40 years uh, around things like car seat safety or um, tobacco, we can see that a lot of gains and strides have been made um, in eliminating, eliminating things that cause poor health. Um, we've done a lot and made a lot of progress when it comes to smoking and tobacco, and there's a lot of work that's continuing on to ensure that, uh, in particular, communities who are still impacted most by the usage and promotion and availability of tobacco are addressed. In recent years, uh, we've seen some shifts around norms that even some of the largest health providers, uh, care providers, treatment providers um, are, are doing around things like tobacco. Um, we can think back, um, and in some places this is still the case and a lot of work is happening to address it, uh, the idea that tobacco products are being sold in pharmacies, and pharmacies are really a place where people are trying to access um, you know, medicine, treatment opportunities, uh, continue to invest in their health, and it's a little counterintuitive um, to then think about those products that are in fact causing major health issues in our communities to be sold and promoted. Um, as I mentioned, in recent years there's been some norms change around that, and, and we saw groups like CVS uh, and even Walgreens and others kind of step up to the plate and uh, recognize that this that this mixed messaging uh, was problematic. And so many stores and chains have started to adopt uh, a practice uh, in which they are no longer promoting tobacco products or even selling them uh, in, in the way they have been for so many years. Um, I think there's a lot of you know, interest now to think about other products that are being sold in pharmacies or in um, other sort of health care arenas. And, and begin to change the norms um, around that. So it's a big, it's a big shift, and it, it does cause and, and brings about a lot of impact. I think one of the things that we've learned in the history of tobacco or car seat safety, um, motorcycle uh, safety, even even the food work that has been happening over the last decade, um, is that the ideas of one generation really become the instinct of the next. And we have D.H. Lawrence to thank for that very um, 
important quote that can really help to guide our strategies moving forward. I want to recognize that many of you may be in that field already around norms change, in particular as it relates to healthy food and physical activity access. Um, and we've seen so much project progress and so much success in providing um, access and affordability uh, to um, healthy food and, and physical activity um, opportunities. Um, what comes to mind for me is, is a lot of the great work to introduce and maintain hydration stations uh, in schools and in public spaces. The image here comes from um, Central California where hydration stations allow um, students in elementary and middle school to access um, free water, uh, clean uh, water during the day to be able to keep up with that important messaging of coming through uh, programs and education um, and a lot of the sort of services that are, that are provided. But we also have to recognize that um, these efforts, while incredibly important, need to have an additional lens to operate in a way that ensures that all communities, all people and populations um, have the ability to access um, the resources that we're able to provide. I think, you know, in, in recent years, there's no no bigger example um, than the water crisis that uh, we have, you know, seen emerge uh, in places like Michigan um, and comparing, you know, what's happening in, in Flint um, with other parts of the country and understanding that access to free, um, clean, safe water is still a goal of many of our communities, um, including many in California. And we have a lot of work to do to ensure that we are addressing the inequities um, for people and communities at large to access not only, you know, an important um, health promoting product like water, but to ensure the system um, and the policies that bring those resources um, to our communities are going to protect the people uh, and the populations and communities they are meant to serve. So we really kind of are intentional about how we identify not only the disparities, but really the, the inequities um, that uh, many of our communities are, are facing. Um, I always um, appreciate an opportunity to get a sense, you know, in rooms that I'm in and, and conversations that I'm a part of um, to tap into the work that people are doing. And, um, you know, in a future opportunity one day when we're able to be, uh, you know, together in person, um, I'd love to do a little bit of this sort of question um, asking with you all um, because I think it's important for us to recognize that, you know, we are all uh, working towards the, the same impact and progress together and where many of us are facing um, challenges that, you know, predate us, predate decision making um, that we've been a part of and that our communities have been a part of, but it's important for us to, to recognize this as we build the strategies to eliminate disparities um, and advance health equity. Um, when I work with young people sometimes, um, you know, I ask them to do sort of an impromptu um, survey of, of, of what is available and accessible in their neighborhoods. And one of the questions that we put out there is, you know, raise your hand if um, your neighborhood has more alcohol outlets than grocery stores. And in most cases, in the areas that we're working in, um, most of the young people or the adults raise their hand. And I think that's important, whether they're coming from the same neighborhoods or different ones, to recognize that there are challenges, um, you know, all around and that there's a lot of power and opportunity um, for all of us to be working on, on this together. But the fact that so many neighborhoods have more alcohol, tobacco outlets and grocery stores starts to give us a picture of sort of the design and policies all around us. Um, another question we, we sort of survey is around, you know, raise your hand if you can name a neighborhood in your county where your grandparents would have been prevented from living because of their race, ethnicity, or religion. And many folks, you know, kind of have to check back in and, and, and realize that, in fact, um, in, in the past there have been neighborhoods uh, in which their families were not uh, welcome, accepted, or, or able um, to be sort of, you know, safe, safely part of the community because of um, 
practices and policies uh, in the past that have really limited where people of color, low-income people um, have been able to, to live. And that all really is a way to reflect on how um, we're here today experiencing and facing disparities and inequities, um, not by happenstance, but really that there has been a production of inequity in a number of different systems that shape our communities um, that we sort of need to acknowledge and recognize in, in order to help to address. Some of the work that Prevention Institute um, is, is focused on um, is around thinking about uh, a public health uh, approach and partnership with housing uh, partners and systems to be able to make the connection between, you know, public health and housing. And, and part of our um, sort of exploration has been about the level um, and quantity and types of policies and practices in the past that have really led us to not only a shortfall in housing, but a lack of, of quality, um, safe and healthy housing that um, families can uh, afford. And we know that that has a huge impact on health. So thinking back to some of those policies and practices, whether it's disproportionate siting of hazardous land use, um, zoning that has, um, you know, split apart communities, things like interstate highway systems, how those have been placed in communities, disinvestment in urban core, segregation laws, small business practices, suburban investment, um, so many different policies that have really um, increased inequities in our, our communities. And so really acknowledging all of the ways that those past policies have um, shaped the conditions in our community. Um, we know that housing affects health, um, how the cost, the high cost burden of housing, um, overcrowding, substandard housing conditions, housing instability, evictions, displacement, and homelessness. And I know homelessness is a, is a critical issue in California and that many of you are working tirelessly to support people who are unable to secure housing um, to be able to get the resources they need um, to become you know, stable and healthier and, and ultimately come out of a homeless situation. Um, I think if you think about, you know, broadly from there, the social factors, financial instability, poor educational outcomes, neighborhood instability, the disruption of social networks and cultural support, um, we start to see that the magnitude uh, of these issues and the fact that they are very much translating into poor health outcomes. Um, and there's a lot of uh, research and studies that have really pointed to um, housing issues um, really kind of impacting um, and being connected to uh, lower rates of, you know, mental health and well-being, um, childhood development, higher rates of respiratory infection, um, access to care, uh, higher rates of chronic disease. So these are all areas that we need to think about. Um, one of the sort of ways in which, you know, production of inequity in housing has happened um, in California and other parts of the nation are in practices of, of redlining, um, where, you know, in the past um, and even in, in current day, um, you know, entire populations, um, communities of color, in particular low-income communities, um, have been unable to secure, you know, uh, resources, loans from financial institutions, um, and that was an intentional practice to ensure that, you um, you know, these groups and communities would, would not, in fact, take, take, be part of different parts of, you know, cities, like in this case, um, the city uh, of Oakland and the county of Alameda. So these are really big barriers. In fact, what we're talking about is um, structural drivers of inequity and poor health and thinking about them as the distribution of, of power, money, and resources nationally and globally that fashion the way that societies are organized. So these include things um, like uh, biases, norms, um, values, things that are, uh, we could kind of point to as the isms, racism, sexism, ableism, um, all, of, all of the things that, you know, kind of fashion the way that we make decisions and allocate resources um, at a global, national, state, and local level. The opportunity um, that many of you are focused on and that really has built momentum over the last 10, 15 years, is focusing on the community determinants of health. 
health, those daily living conditions, those environments where people live, play, and pray, because it allows us to alter um, and push back against structural drivers and provide opportunity to improve health and safety and advance health equity. I wanted to take just a moment to kind of um, share with you the health equity description that we use um, that is uh, really drawn from uh, Paula Braveman and, and, and um, partners um, that really sort of talks about health equity, meaning that, that everyone, regardless of who they are, their color of their skin, their level of education, their gender or sexual identity, whether or not they have a disability, the job that they have, or the neighborhood that they live in, has an equal opportunity to achieve optimal health. So given that that's a very comprehensive um, goal, um, how do we get there? Uh, the work that we've been doing at Prevention Institute and that many communities across the nation and the state have been engaged in is using a framework, um, the Tool for Health and Resilience in Vulnerable Environments, or Thrive, to be able to um, assess, identify, and act on policies, practices, and environmental changes that can, again, push back against structural drivers and change and alter the daily living conditions um, of people in communities. We've organized that in sort of three clusters, people, place, and equitable opportunity. And I'll do a very sort of brief overview of what is found in those clusters. Um, we describe these as the community determinants of health because um, in any given community, um, these factors uh, may exist, either to promote or to prohibit health. And so there's an opportunity to really identify um, where there are some existing assets and strengths um, so that they can be leveraged to address any deficiencies or, or weaknesses in these areas. So under people, for example, we have social networks of trust, participation and willingness to act for the common good, and norms and culture. So this is really about people connecting and wanting to work together for, for the you know, good of their community and for their neighborhoods and families. Um, equitable opportunity identifies education, um, and this is really, you know, the educational system, ensuring that there are schools uh, that are, you know, clean and safe and uh, affordable um, and accessible in their communities that provide them with uh, quality education. Um, that's connected to the idea of living wages and local wealth. It's uh, the ability of families and people to um, have the means to support themselves uh, and their family in a sustainable way and, in fact, to build um, local wealth um, and to be able to pass that on um, for, you know, future generations. Um, I think the, the final uh, one that uh, many of you are working in is, is in the place cluster, what's sold and how it's promoted, the look and feel and safety, um, and housing. Parks and open space, air, water and soil, getting around or transportation, and arts and cultural expression. So we'll take a moment actually to go through some of these, but I wanted to point out that uh, while we describe them as three different clusters and a set of um, uh, 12 community determinants, they really do overlap and they really do connect with each other because, you know, it's only when people, opportunity around equity and place come together do we get, um, you know, kind of that bigger norms change. So in those clusters, you know, they're, they're interrelated and, and synergistic in many ways. Um, some of the strategies that we're seeing be successful around the state and country um, is, for example, having health systems really be involved in ensuring that there is um, uh, housing that is affordable, accessible, and um, safe uh, for communities. So groups like St. John's, um, which is based in um, South Los Angeles, or even Cincinnati Children's Hospital in Ohio, that have become engaged um, with collaboratives, with legal aid societies, with community-based organizations, to hotspot where there are high rates of things like asthma admissions so that they can be able to, uh, to assess and understand um, why there might be high levels of these admissions, you know, in the first place. And, and being able to pinpoint, um, even to zip codes or census tracts, where there might be issues with the housing quality that is really not only um, exacerbating um, health disparities, but creating them. Um, by, um, you know, as, as folks come into the ER treated, they go right back home, um, perhaps to a place that has, you know, mold or other 
allergens that, that really, you know, bring uh, asthma right back in there. And so for Cincinnati, for example, they've partnered with a number of groups to actually um, ensure that the housing um, is up to code, is being enforced, um, and have started to see a decline in those asthma admissions. Um, I also wanted to point out, um, I know because um, Active Living Research is, is, a, is a California, we're very proud that they're California, but we're all, we also know that um, there's a lot of great work happening in San Diego around this about getting, you know, kids to be active and to be thinking about how schools can be a hub for increased physical activity minutes. Um, and there's some great research um, that's coming out about how policies and practices that provide in-class activity breaks or require daily PA, uh, PE, physical education, um, that support safe routes to school, that ensure that there's physical activity minutes and after school programming can in fact increase physical activity minutes um, for children and young people. And I think that is such a great opportunity um, and approach to take on to ensure that we are addressing, um, you know, issues of chronic disease, of childhood obesity prevention by building in physical activity and access to quality food um, in the places, in the hubs across our communities. Um, the other example I wanted to share, and I know many of the folks um, joining the call today will be able to speak to other uh, examples and practices, um, is Mandela Marketplace, um, based in Oakland, who in sort of their early years were asking the question around how do we increase access to healthy food in our community, but do it in a way that also builds local economy. The local economy piece was almost um, sort of to par with the healthy food access piece because so many of the community members, residents, uh, groups there felt that at the root of these issues of, of poor health um, was poverty and disinvestment. So several initiatives came out of the process of asking themselves this question, um, one of them being the launch of a farmer's market as a way to activate the community around food um, and to generate um, interest and commitment to local fresh food, um, ultimately with bringing in a community-owned grocery store um, into the area, which they were able um, over time to connect with a local community-based organization um, and use financing mechanisms to bring in um, this uh, marketplace as well as bring um, in a food cooperative. Um, and a lot of the work that, that they were doing was about ensuring that um, they would create sort of a buzz and a hub around healthy food. So um, out of this marketplace exists a food cooperative, but as, uh, as well um, a kitchen that it operates as a cafe um, and people can get, um, you know, ready-made um, whole foods um, in there on a daily basis. They also sort of extended their work um, into healthy retail and worked with local businesses to incentivize them to be healthier retailers. So while they were helping to provide some of that um, fresh produce, they would then work with them, you know, one-on-one -on -one via technical assistance to get them to sort of um, you know, build their practices around healthy food. So some really exciting work that's happening. Um, maybe on the note that I might um, end on is just that the work that you all are doing um, and that many of us are invested on um, is really about connecting opportunities to improve physical health um, with also mental health. And I think it's been very important that uh, we've started to make the connection between physical health and mental health and the idea that by investing in social determinants of health, community determinants of health, to advance health equity, we will uh, really be affecting not only physical health outcomes, but mental health outcomes. Um, I, I will pause there. I know we may have some questions at the end, um, but just wanted to thank everyone uh, for uh, this opportunity to get to share some of this work and exciting examples um, of obesity prevention and, and health equity efforts across the nation. Thank you, Sandra. Really appreciate the presentation. And uh, as, as Sandra mentioned, we will be taking questions at the end of the uh, webinar, but please feel free to go ahead and start queuing those up in the Q&A box or chat box. We'll be checking both of them uh, throughout the webinar, and we'll be revisiting those at the end. Um, and I also wanted to mention this is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, and we'll share that link after 
the event. Um, next, we are lucky to have um, Alicia Fernandez, who is a professor of medicine uh, at University of California, San Francisco, and a general internist at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, where she practices primary care medicine and attends on the medical wards. Her research is in health and healthcare disparities with a focus on diabetes, Latino health, immigrant health, and language barriers. A member of the UCSF Academy of Medical Educators, she received the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Professorship for hum Humanism in Medicine uh, in 2009 to 2013. Since 2014, Dr. Fernandez has been a member of the Board of Governors of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute and the National Academy of Science Roundtable on Health Literacy. She is co-editor of the Lang textbook and medical management of vulnerable, the medical management of vulnerable and underserved patients. Dr. Fernandez received her BA at Yale, her MD at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and completed her residency, chief residency, and fellowship at UCSF. At UCSF, Dr. Fernandez serves as the health equity leader of the SOM Differences Matter Initiative. She also directs a UCSF uh, Prof Path, an academic career and research training program for URM students and students focused on health disparities research. She's co-PI of RISE, a national training program and implementation science for URM faculty, faculty and core PI of SF Build, a joint capacity building program between UCSF and San Francisco State University. So once again, I'd really like to thank uh, Alicia, and uh, she will be making her presentation now. Um, um, so, um, so as I was saying, I'm, I, I'll, I'll talk uh, briefly uh, about um, some of the uh, national data. Um, I'm going to share with you back your own data uh, uh, produced locally. Um, this is what academics do, uh, and uh, and I hope it'll be useful just to set um, the stage for some of the discussion that we hope will follow um, these presentations. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the policy options and what do we know, what's the evidence, uh, what's the evidence around them. So my overarching goal for today is to, um, is to highlight the local uh, uh, awareness of local data really have people have a, a, a good sense of the evidence on what the policy options are and what knowledge can be harnessed from uh, other initiatives in other parts of the country. So with that, let's talk about the U.S. Um, this is a graph from the CDC. It shows uh, self-reported obesity, not overweight, obesity um, among white adults. And you will see that California in the green is between 20 and 25 percent self-reported obesity, and the middle of the country, both the more southern, more poorer uh, um, states, but the middle as a whole, um, has larger uh, numbers. Look at the 30 uh, to 35 um, uh, groups, and this is West Virginia here, uh, over 35. Now let's look at blacks. Uh, um, and what you, we see is huge shift in the overwhelming colors with uh, over 35% of the uh, African American population uh, with obesity in, uh, uh, in, in, in a large chunk of the United States and the rest between 30 and 35. Um, and now here are Latinos and the year is Arizona and uh, the South, including North, and other states where there are a lot of low-income Latinos with uh, numbers over 35 percent, and California uh, uh, between 30 and 35 um, percent. This shows us some of the same thing um, by uh, uh, divided by gender, and here you can see that for men, White and uh, white and African American men roughly um, the same um, uh, uh, prevalence of obesity, much lower in Asians and a little bit higher uh, among uh, 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 Latinos, Hispanics, and uh, whereas for women the differences are much larger. Um, for the, here is uh, white women, uh, uh, African American women at 54 percent uh, of obesity, and uh, Hispanic women at. 50% obesity. Again, Asians very low at 15%. Um, uh, uh, Here we have the prevalence of obesity in youth, and this is um, 
uh, separated out by age group. And you can see that as kids get older, it's about, well, even throughout the age, it's about 20% obesity. And in girls, also about uh, uh, 17 to 20% obesity, depending on uh, which age group uh, we're looking at. So here, uh, uh, what, what this shows mo most clearly, this is 2 to 5 in blue, 6 to 11 in green, in the dark green, and 12 to 19. And what you can see is that already by middle school in boys, uh, we have high uh, levels of obesity, and in girls, it keeps increasing. And here is a similar uh, graph, but this time by race ethnicity. And in boys, we have huge differences with Hispanic boys uh, uh, having uh, levels of obesity of 28%. Uh, and Hispanic girls and African American girls, uh, are 25 and 23 percent. Um, so, in among children, racial and ethnic disparities are more pronounced uh, than among adult men, for example, and even more pronounced than among adult women. Much of this is driven uh, by food insecurity. We'll be talking about that later. And here, uh, this uh, simply illustrates that while the prevalence of food insecurity is very high among Americans overall at around 13%, among Latinos, it's around 20% when you look at the entire country. And obviously, that correlates highly with income inequality, in which uh, uh, here we have Hispanic households and non-Hispanic households. This includes whites, African American, and all others and a large difference in uh, the median income. Let's turn now to San Diego uh, County uh, uh, data. And much of this comes from your very own, uh, uh, very excellent San Diego uh, Childhood Obesity Initiative uh, report um, put out in 2016 and sponsored uh, by um, uh, a, 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 quite a number of uh, San Diego-based excuse me, organizations as well as San Diego County. And what this really brought home to me as someone who has not spent very much time in San Diego County and really only spent a lot of, uh, spent time in, uh, in San Diego, uh, the city, is what uh, pretty large variations uh, there are um, in the different regions of the county. This should, I hope, a square with your own sense of what uh, makes sense in San Diego. But for example, the southern region, having south region having 60% uh, um, uh, Latino population, 42% in the central region, uh, with, with the smallest region at north central region uh, being 16% Latino, which is about the same as the general uh, US. Um, that tracks closely with language spoken uh, at home. And, um, and here uh, we have in the orange uh, folks who speak Spanish only. Again, very large group in uh, the South region at 20% uh, of, um, uh, of the population uh, there. Median household income can be a very uh, confusing um, uh, thing to look at. And what I think this shows again is the variation in the region. And also that this is not one of the poorest uh, regions in uh, California, in which even the uh, South region has a, a, a median uh, household income um, that is um, uh, not uh, that far off the median household income of the country. However, because of cost of living and so on, um, the number of folks on uh, food stamps or SNAP is quite high um, with uh, about 14% uh, of the families with children in uh, the central region and about 10% uh, in the east region and south region. And this illustrates a little bit of what we're saying uh, with San Diego not being as poor as some of the other counties uh, in uh, the northern California, the central valley, or uh, southern neighbors, but uh, still um, showing a um, about 16% of children uh, living officially uh, in poverty. 
That, of course, tracks very closely with childhood obesity. And what we're seeing here is that these are children two to three, three to four, and four to five. And what we see is that among, when you compare Hispanics and non-Hispanics in each group, the proportion that is obese uh, is quite different. For example, among um, uh, the four to five group, 17.8% versus the 11.7. And you see that at every age. So um, high levels of overweight and obesity and uh, large uh, disparity. And here we see the same thing. This time the white column is on uh, the left. And what we see is, um, again, differences in uh, large differences among fifth graders, um, more than twice the difference, differences uh, for seventh graders, uh, ninth graders, and among all students. And again, really showing um, almost a um, threefold uh, increase in obesity as, uh, as one um, uh, goes up in grades. And this uh, tracks with economic uh, disadvantage. Um, and here in these final two columns for economically disadvantaged students, we see, again, twice a doubling of obesity rates among the economically disadvantaged and, the, uh, the, um, and compared to the non-economically uh, disadvantaged. And a reminder that this includes only public school students. So you can imagine um, that, um, that there are, uh, are um, many uh, not economically disadvantaged students who are in the private school system and who have even lower uh, rates of obesity. So with that context, I think it's also important to bring in one more thing. San Diego, like all of California, has uh, many fairly recent immigrants. We used to believe in the healthy immigrant effect, that if people are too ill to immigrate, they, to emigrate, they, they don't. They stay where they are. Um, and, and by and large, <clears throat> immigrants tend to live longer and be healthier. But in the last 15 years, we have seen a dramatic shift in, um, in conditions in Mexico. Um, it is now either the first or the second most obese country in the world, the other one being, of course, the United States, so it depends on who's, uh, uh, how the studies are done. Over 74% of women and 70%, nearly 70% of men are overweight or obese. And this has uh, come across, uh, while this is mainly driven by urbanization, there, um, there have been tremendous dietary changes in Mexico and tremendous changes in the level of sedentarism um, and in the levels of uh, important protection. So, for example, Mexico went from 20 years ago being one of the low, uh, highest countries in the Americas in terms of breastfeeding to now being uh, one of the lowest right next to Haiti and uh, uh, with very few women um, um, having sustained breastfeeding. Importantly, in Mexico, there has been, a, a, Mexico is one of the, uh, is the highest consumer of sugar sweetened beverages in the world. And this, um, not surprisingly, has helped um, fuel the obesity epidemic. Um, by uh, two years of age, uh, 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 Mexican children are drinking uh, at least one uh, soda a day. Why do we talk about this? Again, it challenges the notion that immigrants are healthier and that folks coming in, um, uh, folks perhaps who are Spanish speaking and less acculturated might have healthier uh, habits. That is no longer true. Um, and, has, and, and, and really that has been one of the biggest um, changes in the last uh, 15, 20 years in Mexico. So to sum up, in San Diego, um, I'm sorry, this is a little out of space. Um, I wanted to make uh, to to reinforce what was said earlier that half the public school students are Latinos, half of them are low income. Um, large, uh, large, large disparities in obesity rates. And what I'm not going to talk about, but is covered uh, beautifully in this report, very high variation in school wellness initiatives in terms of. Uh, recess and uh, some of the data that Sandra presented, the number of uh, uh, the school, the, the number of, of schools that don't even have recess, 
or don't have uh, or where the school nutrition programs are not in line with national uh, standards. I commend the uh, report authors for concluding that that will require both intensive and intentional health equity strategies. So let's shift now to talk about those strategies. But before I do, I did need to make the point that this is obviously not only what people are bringing in uh, from home, uh, from Mexico, or from growing up in San Diego, that this is also partly the result of intentional marketing. Uh, for example, one uh, well-known beverage executive pointed out that 86% of the company's growth um, through 2020 in the youth market comes from multicultural consumers, and especially Hispanics, concluded that focusing on this segment is critical to the company's future growth. And we see that in beveraging marketing directly at uh, Latino youth and, uh, uh, and on uh, uh, Hispanic um, and on Spanish language uh, television, Spanish language cultural events, and so on. So let's shift now to talk about policy options. And let's talk first about sugar-sweetened beverages. Actually, I want to talk first about uh, food insecurity, but I want to explain why I'm going to focus on sugar-sweetened uh, beverages. And a lot of that has to do with, um, and I, I, this may be uh, uh, well known to everyone on the call, but may know that 30 of, of the added sugars in the U.S. diet, 37% of them come in through sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, not, and those include not only, um, not only um, soda, uh, but also uh, sports drinks. You may have seen the recent report that I think came out uh, two days ago showing that while soda consumption is down in California, sport drink consumption is uh, up. So it, uh, it is this, this uh, combination of sugar sweetened beverages um, that, that we will uh, be talking about. And specifically, um, in the, the range of options include, besides taxes and removing uh, sugary drinks, which we will focus on, the reformulation of products, which is not, I think, uh, currently um, uh, a big policy uh, initiative in, on the regulatory sphere um, in the U.S., warning labels, which has been uh, which are being widely uh, used in Latin America, Chile, Ecuador, and Mexico have all um, uh, created a warning label on uh, packaged food. In Chile in particular, this has uh, uh, been very well done with sort of a green light, yellow light, red light um, uh, sticker explaining why the, this particular food is uh, red lighted or green lighted. Um, and then finally, uh, options of restricting marketing to children, as has been done uh, somewhat in the U.S. and, and, and throughout uh, much of the world. But it is on this nexus of poverty and hunger that I want to focus uh, next, and on the importance of eliminating food insecurity. Um, food insecurity is highly associated um, with obesity. Here we see in children who at kindergarten are measured to be food insecure are uh, more obese, this is obesity prevalence, than their food secure counterparts. And that continues, when they're measured at kindergarten, that continues through first grade, second grade, and third grade, and in fact, the difference is only increasing. Similarly, when children are measured uh, for food security at first grade, there is a large difference in obesity prevalence, and that continues as kids get older. Foods, there is no debate that food security, insecurity, I'm sorry, is associated with obesity as people seek uh, to replace um, uh, more expensive, uh, uh, healthier foods with uh, high caloric, uh, cheaper foods. Um, something that may not be as clear is that we see this very much in adults with diabetes, particularly uh, this is uh, work that I did with one of my colleagues in which what we're seeing is that uh, for people who are food uh, insecure here in the light pink, they are more likely to have poor glycemic control. So people who are food secure, more concentrated down here with good hemoglobin A1Cs, good glycemic control, people who are more insecure, food insecure, lead the way in poor control. 
And not only do they tend to have higher blood sugars because they're, they're eating um, uh, uh, foods uh, with, uh, uh, of worse nutritional quality, um, um, they uh, also tend to have more hypoglycemia. And in fact, uh, and that is not surprising, that people who report food insecurity report are, are more likely to report multiple episodes of hypoglycemia. My colleague went on to demonstrate that this was that hypoglycemia hospitalizations are more common at the end of the month uh, throughout California as people um, run out of food but continue taking their uh, insulin and come in hypoglycemic. Because the association between food insecurity and obesity and diabetes particularly are now so well chosen, the healthcare system is trying to figure out how to reduce uh, food insecurity. And we see uh, Kaiser, we see uh, Boston Medical creating uh, food pantries. People are talking about pharmacies, as in pharmacies. And we see simply um, hand, uh, handing out uh, food. This is Minneapolis in which uh, 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 the pediatricians um, uh, will hand out food as uh, parents uh, come to the clinic. Um, some people think that we should uh, uh, um, uh, divert um, dollars going into healthcare to do dollars into preventing hospital admission. And as you may have read in the New York Times last week and, uh, and in uh, the scientific literature, um, San Francisco has engaged in several large research programs looking at whether or not healthy, a healthy fruit and vegetable um, voucher program um, can, um, can uh, improve um, uh, the control of people with diabetes, hypertension, and congestive heart failure. Um, what I'd like to say about this is that we don't know how to do this, and that these are studies. And I want to go back to one of the points that Sandra made about um, where she was talking about the marketplace and talking about how to um, uh, combat uh, food deserts by, create, by community development. It is not at all clear to anyone that food pharmacies and having healthcare hospitals uh, could, um, um, uh, distribute food um, is at all better than a voucher that allows people to go into uh, the stores and have them and, um, and spend uh, locally or programs to create local marketplaces. So there is no settled science uh, on that while the science of food insecurity and obesity and, and its relationship to obesity, to obesity and diabetes is now well established. Um, oops. That's interesting. So let's talk about taxation. I first want to make sure that we're all clear on the sort of uh, logic model of taxation. It says that if we impose a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, the prices of sugar-sweetened beverages will increase. The consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages will be reduced, particularly by among folks who are most price, price sensitive, which is to say low income people. And consequently, the prevalence of obesity and overweight will be reduced. It's important to point out, oops, that these, I'm sorry, that these assumptions uh, rest on, uh, that, the, that this logic model rests on key, on key assumptions. One is that the retailers and manufacturers do not absorb the full cost of the tax, but instead will pass it on to consumers. Second, that the product is an ordinary good and not uh, super elastic, which is inelastic, sorry, in which as its price increases, consumption will decrease. And then finally, that, that, you, that when people decrease sugar-sweetened beverages, they won't simply substitute it by cheaper uh, um, uh, products that may cause as much um, obesity as the sugar-sweetened beverages. So these are the questions that have been on the uh, scientific uh, research agenda as uh, countries have moved um, and cities have moved um, to impose uh, uh, and or uh, elect uh, taxes. So uh, Mexico and eight, eight US local governments uh, have done so. Many other countries of the world are in the process of adopting 
uh, sugar uh, sweetened beverage taxes. There have been nine rigorous evaluations, and just to go to the bottom line, all show a decrease in consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, and all show an increase in consumption of water. So Mexico led the way, not surprisingly, uh, with its uh, huge obesity epidemic, and they uh, created a tax in uh, 2014. In the first year, they saw a 6% decrease in purchases, and in the second year, impact was a 9% decrease uh, in purchases of sugar-sweetened beverages. And this was true despite uh, not fully passing on the cost. The beverage companies did not fully pass on the cost to consumers. Um, more at, uh, closer at hand um, is Berkeley. And here we have, um, to, uh, uh, the, in blue, the tax Berkeley stores and, um, and, um, and a taxed, uh, untaxed uh, Berkeley stores. And what they show here is that after the, um, after, this is the pre-tax period, this is the post-tax period, and we see a great uh, separation um, in the uh, um, uh, prices of those stores that had tax beverages and those stores that had untaxed uh, beverages. So prices were passed on. And at one year post-tax, we see a decrease in sugar-sweetened beverages, but also in diet soft drinks, which has been true in other places as well, and a large increase in plain water consumption. The rest of these are not uh, statistically uh, significant. And in another study also done in Berkeley, <coughs> in low-income communities, uh, what was seen is a reduction in, uh, this is actually a 20% reduction in um, uh, pre and post tax, whereas in the comparison uh, community, there was no such reduction of consumption in sugar, in, in sugar sweetened beverages and a very large increase in uh, drinking of water. So taxes do uh, seem to work to decrease sugar, sugar sweetened beverages and do not seem to result in compensatory drinking of other um, cal highly caloric beverages. And in fact, the uh, compensation appears to be uh, with water. With that in mind, let's talk about some of the community activities where people were not able, uh, have not, either not, were, have not passed or not attempted to pass a sugar sweetened beverage tax. And it may be worth mentioning at this point that those communities that have attempted but failed to pass a sugar sweetened beverage tax have also seen a decrease in consumption, likely related to the heightened awareness of uh, impact on health in association uh, uh, with the, the tax campaign. What I want to talk about now is a multi-level initiative that was done in Howard County, Maryland. Now, this is not a poor community. It has a relatively um, high level of income, but what it has is a lot of income inequality. It does not have a large Latino population, but African Americans constitute about 15% of the population. And they did a multi-level initiative working on four levels. On the interpersonal levels, they made available an online tool, and they did sort of street team type outreach at fairs and summer parks, swimming pools, um, handing out healthy drinks and trying to raise uh, population awareness. At the organizational level, they did many things. Uh, uh, at Hopkins, uh, uh, the, Johns Hopkins is located there, and they um, did a healthy beverages initiative, removing all unhealthy beverages um, from the hospital um, uh, communities, much in the same way that we prohibit uh, uh, tobacco. Um, they worked with the Academy of Pediatricians to teach local pediatricians best practices. They got 50 community-based organizations to commit to only healthy beverages at their events and to approve vending machine choices if they had vending machines in their buildings. Um, they worked with the dental coalitions to also uh, teach best practices on counseling to local dentists, um, change the Head Start curriculum, and had 70 uh, child care facilities certified as healthy child care uh, facilities um, uh, by the county. So we have the interpersonal level and the organizational level. But we also have the community level. 
They had four major uh, community health institutions, including Hopkins, uh, agree to joint to fund joint data collection so as to be able to evaluate the impact of uh, all sorts of initiatives happening uh, in, in their community. Um, uh, a community of uh, sugar-free kids was started, a coalition of 240 members, which mainly focused on raising public awareness with lots of media. They established community partnerships with key groups, and here some of the key groups were the faith organizations, the teachers' union, and nonprofits. Um, they uh, funded a media campaign, and they worked with the Joint Chamber of Commerce to fund a study on obesity. And then last, at the policy level, they changed school policies using the wellness, um, uh, WellSat, the uh, school assessment uh, test to change all vending machines and um, have all uh, school served uh, meals uh, meet um, uh, local, uh, meet nutritional standards. They passed a state law saying that all facilities that care for children can only serve healthy beverages. And they created a, a state a, a county a policy that uh, if uh, uh, buildings uh, were on county property uh, or uh, county funded youth programs, they needed to meet national standards for vending machines and um, and um, um, and uh, foods. So this is uh, what they um, showed. Here is the two years prior to the test and you're looking at control supermarket control stores in yellow and interventions uh, uh, and intervention stores located in Howard. Um, and what we see is that they track uh, very, very closely in the two years prior. Oops. And in the two year, and then as the campaign starts, the volume of sales of sugar sweetened beverages um, uh, decreases dramatically and does so over two years. Um, in uh, in Howard County, uh, whereas it continues in the same level in the uh, comparison counties. And I found this really useful. And the reason it was very useful is one, to see that the impact keeps going um, for two years, at least two years, and, is, and also that it is sustainable because this is um, three full years after uh, the campaign uh, started. And here it is in data, uh, minus 20% uh, uh, a reduction in the volume um, in regular soda as opposed to a 0.8 change in the comparison stores. And you can see for yourself, minus 25% on sports drinks, 15% um, on fruit drinks, and again, diet soda and 100% fruit juice also uh, going down. I want to uh, just briefly talk about an initiative in San Francisco. This has been, uh, 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 it's called uh, San Francisco HIP, Health Improvement Partnership. Um, the lead organizations are listed here and they include UCSF, the Department of Public Health, a number of uh, ethnic um, health groups, um, a consortium of the community hospitals, uh, San Francisco Unified uh, School District, and uh, public organizations. And these are their achievements uh, that were recently published um, and that include that most San Francisco hospitals have at this point, they've actually all implemented healthy beverages policies prohibiting serving or selling sugar sweetened beverages. As an aside, at UCSF, the evaluation is not yet published, uh, but we have seen um, significant decreases in the BMI and in the waist circumference of employees, particularly among the janitorial uh, uh, and other blue collar uh, staff that went from drinking two to three uh, fully loaded uh, sodas a day to having only access at work uh, to diet soda unless they chose to bring it themselves. Uh, there are ordinances banning use of government funds to purchase SSB. As you uh, probably know, there was a, a sugar tax ballot measure that was first defeated and then passed in November of 2016. Um, uh, neighborhood tap water filling stations, uh, like the one that Sandra showed, that are attractive um, and are now located in low-income neighborhoods. Um, a change in the policy at San Francisco uh, Unified School District, prohibiting sales or serving, and training of community health workers. And again, what we're seeing is 
a multi-level, multi-component intervention. And this is most um, um, uh, uh, placed out there as what the, the, the as, as, as a intentional use of a collective impact model in which, as you know, the core elements include common agendas, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and backbone uh, support. Um, we uh, also like to think that there was some um, uh, particular uh, use um, of having uh, the medical school uh, heavily involved in terms of being able to produce uh, research. But what is really needed is obviously the common vision uh, of uh, health equity. So in summary, policy interventions such as sugar, uh, sweet beverages, taxes, uh, do appear to work. The logic model is sound. Uh, I uh, really feel now that multi-level, multi-component intervention, when led by community coalitions, can create very significant and sustained change. And we will be, I think, seeing that in a drop in BMI. And then at the same time, going back to where we started from, um, that uh, clearly um, much work is needed. So let me stop there and, uh, and uh, pass the baton on, and I'll look forward to your questions. Oh, and here are some uh, very key resources. Uh, um, the Obesity Center, Sugar uh, Science, UCSF, and Obesity uh, Prevention. Thank you, Alicia. Much appreciated. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, before I pass over to Dr. Beck, I'm going to shorten her bio just a bit. Um, but I did want to note that um, Amy received her MD and MPH degrees from the University of Connecticut and is currently an assistant professor of pediatrics at uh, University of California, San Francisco, and practices general pediatrics at Zuckerberg, San Francisco General, uh, where she also serves as the co-director of the Healthy Lifestyles Clinic. Uh, Dr. Beck's research focuses on the development and evaluation of novel primary care-based strategies to prevent obesity in low-income Latino children, as well as innovative approaches to obesity treatment in this population. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton over to Amy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, now that Alicia has provided an overview of policy-level interventions to address childhood obesity, I'm going to focus on individual and family-level interventions, so thank you for the opportunity to present. So my objectives today are to briefly review the evidence on what works to treat childhood obesity broadly, and also some more specific evidence on what may work for Latino children. Then we'll describe some of our experiences with attempting to translate that evidence into practice at the Healthy Lifestyles Clinic at San Francisco General. And then finally, I'll very briefly discuss potential benefits of initiating obesity prevention in infancy and mention some future directions uh, in this arena. So with respect to the literature on childhood obesity treatment, there is good quality evidence that intensive behavioral interventions involving the child's family that aim to modify child diet, physical activity, screen time usage, and parenting approaches can reduce child BMI, or at least we see this on average in a study population. So typically, some children will experience significant benefits, and others will experience less of a benefit. The study population on the whole will experience a decrease in mean BMI. If you look at the childhood obesity literature, there's actually a lot of variation among interventions. So some interventions have been delivered in a group format, quite a few actually. Some have been delivered one-on-one. -on -one. There are interventions that involve the child and parent together, and some, particularly for school-age children, where it's only the parent who does the intervention. There's also a wide range with respect to who provides interventions. Some are delivered by nutritionists, some by psychologists, some by people who have been specifically trained for the purposes of the study, but who don't necessarily have a nutrition or healthcare background, or in some cases, it's not clear. Um, and it's actually um, it's pretty clear that all of these approaches can work, and the variations don't seem to make a big impact. But there are some critical features of successful interventions. So one is that younger age at program initiation improves the chances of success. It's much easier to treat obesity in a 6 or 7-year-old than in a 16-year-old. Additionally, successful programs tend to be very intensive in terms of frequency and duration. So an intervention that involves 20 sessions over a six-month period is pretty typical in the literature. And finally, ongoing follow-up with some sort of booster intervention is critical. Otherwise, uh, we typically see that the benefits will be erased if the intervention ends with no reinforcement. 
So I wanted to briefly mention two interventions that have been published that were specifically designed for Latino families. So one is called Cabezo La Familia. This is an intervention that was offered in the community center in Nashville, Tennessee. They enrolled Latino children ages two to six and their parents. And the children and parents uh, participated in 90-minute weekly sessions for 12 weeks that were provided by a quote-unquote interventionist. So I'm not entirely clear who that was. Um, and these children experienced a mean reduction in absolute BMI relative to the control. Another intervention is called the Active and Healthy Families Intervention. This is something that was offered in two federally qualified health centers in Contra Costa County here in California. This intervention may enroll Latino children and their parents ages 5 to 12. And the families received five one-hour group sessions every other week from a combined team of a physician, a physician excuse me, nutritionist, and promotora. Uh, and we saw that the intervention group experienced a mean reduction um, in BMI, where there was an actually an increase um, in the control for a weightless control. So again, showing um, benefits for this kind of intervention for Latino children. So now I'd like to briefly talk about the Healthy Lifestyle Clinic uh, at San Francisco General Hospital. So we are a pediatric obesity treatment clinic. We are part of subspecialty pediatric care within a county health system. We receive referrals from primary care providers at San Francisco General and the other San Francisco Department of Public Health Clinic. All of our patients are publicly insured and 80% are Latino. Our clinic is staffed by two physicians, one nurse practitioner and one nutritionist. And our clinic meets for one session per week on Monday evening. This slide just gives you a brief overview of our resources and the patient's flow. So as I said, the patients are referred by their primary care physician. And the first thing that happens when they're referred is that they'll have a comprehensive intake visit with um, one of the physicians or nurse practitioners where we'll look at their diet, physical activity, their medical history, family history and we'll assess for any of the conditions that tend to come along with childhood obesity and come up with a treatment plan for those. Um, we'll also start working with the family on some individual goals um, that can help address the child's weight. And for children who are between the ages of 4 to 12 who are interested in our group program, which I'll be shown in just a second, we really try to encourage them to get involved in this program. And if they agree, we schedule them to attend five groups which are offered every other week with two one-on-one -on -one visits um, that are scheduled just before the group. And then after completing the group, which is typically around the 10 to 11 week process, we'll schedule a follow-up with them and then come up with a plan together with the family uh, based on the child's progress and family preference. For children who are not in the age range or if they're not able to commit to the group if it's too um, intensive or the time is not working for them, we see them back about every one to three months for individual visits, and we tend to alternate between them being one of the physicians, our nurse practitioners, and our nutritionists. So just to briefly describe the group, so uh, we have a five-session curriculum. It's facilitated by one of the clinic providers and also a physical activity teacher. It's offered every other Monday from 5.45 to 7 p.m., so in that evening slot. And the entrance is rolling, so families can start with any of the groups and then continue through the series. Just to give you a sense of the flow, uh, we start with a warm-up with uh, the children um, and parents together, and we encourage participation of siblings, cousins, grandparents, so there's often quite a few people beyond just the patients and the parents attending. We do a warm-up all together. Then the kids go and do a fun physical activity, and the adults stay for parenting and nutrition education. And at the end, everyone comes back together for a healthy snack. This slide, I won't go into too much detail, but just give you an overview of the topics that we cover at each session. So at each session, there is a nutrition and lifestyle topic uh, and also a parenting topic. In terms of the components of the group, we start with introductions to establish rapport. There's a didactic component. Um, we try to do a lot of discussion and idea sharing. We find that parents can, of course, learn from us, but we actually find that they learn more from other parents. Uh, and they also get a lot of social support from other parents. We try to spend time troubleshooting individual challenges that families are facing, um, and again, really trying to draw on the wisdom of the group and the experiences of other um, providers. And then uh, we include some skills building exercises, uh, some goal setting, and we try to send people home with some take home educational materials. Uh, so just to really briefly give you a sense of some of the activities, um, 
one example of one of the components of Group 1 after discussing the health effects which uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, um, which Alicia mentioned, we will show parents a 20-ounce bottle of Coke and demonstrate how to find the calories and the grams of sugar on the food label. Then we'll use a calculator to divide grams of sugar by four to determine the teaspoons of sugar in the bottle. And then we'll demonstrate that content. So it turns out that in that 20-ounce bottle of Coke, there's actually 16 teaspoons or 16 cubes of sugar. Um, so we'll put those, count those out and put them on a plate and it always really generates a big aha moment for families because it's one thing to read 65 grams of sugar, but that's kind of an abstract concept. It's another thing to see 16 sugar cubes on a plate and realize that that's what you're consuming when you drink the Coke. Um, we then create this uh, table on the board with these different columns and hand out different beverages to parents, some sugar sweetened beverages, some 100% fruit juices. Um, and we actually work with parents to fill the information from the beverages into the table then we give them cards that have a picture of a whole fruit um, with the nutritional information for one serving of that fruit. And uh, we work with them to fill that information into the table. Um, and what we end up is something that looks kind of like this, so with the, the beverages on top and the whole fruit on the bottom. And again, there tends to be lots of aha moments. We don't usually need to make this point ourselves. Some people realize the really big differences in terms of um, calories, grams of sugar, and fiber with, between the whole fruit versus the sugar sweetened beverages and also the 100% fruit juice, which has quite a bit of sugar as well. Um, so in terms of some examples of cultural tailoring, all of our sessions are provided in Spanish or bilingually. We try to use culturally appropriate menu planning ideas. We talk a lot about limit setting um, and how to reframe limit setting for families as actually a means to communicate love, both from the literature and from our clinical experience. Um, I think that for a lot of Latino families, restricting food to their child's desires is, is difficult. Um, a lot of Latino families often have a more indulgent feeding style and they use food as a means to communicate love. Um, so we try to reframe that for parents, both for them, their own perspective and also in terms of how they communicate it back to their child. So actually having them practice saying to their child, we're not going to buy soda today and the reason is that I love you so much that I don't want you to drink soda because I don't want you to get diabetes and I want you to stay healthy for your life. Um, we also um, try to address some common nutritional misconceptions that we see in our population. So one is that a lot of families believe that homemade beverages are healthy despite added sugar. So an example would be agua fresca made with um, whole fruits and water, but also with sugar sweetened beverage, or also with the addition of sugar in the majority of cases. A lot of families also believe that in anything that's labeled as all natural or organic is healthy. And a lot of things people think that yogurt drinks are healthy, um, despite the added sugar that some of them have. So again, just a quick example, um, this is a, El Mexicano is a drinkable yogurt, um, very popular um, amongst our patients. And people are purchasing this, you know, considering it to be a healthy option for their child and appropriate for a child who's struggling with obesity. Um, but when you take a closer look at the nutritional information, what we actually see is that one small bottle of this has actually 35 grams of sugar. So activities like these can be a very big eye-opener for families um, and help them to be making healthy choices. Uh, in terms of attention to disparities, so we offer the groups in the evening to accommodate working families. We try to give cost-conscious examples and tips for shopping on a budget. We also have someone working with us in our clinic who does referrals for physical activity. So she works directly with families to assist them with finding programs and registering for the programs and applying for scholarships, which can actually be quite an opaque um, and challenging for families to do, particularly if they're not English speaking, maybe don't have access to the internet at home, and are not familiar with community resources. We also work to actively cultivate relationships within the community within the community with organizations that serve youth, such as San Francisco Parks and Rec, which has been a main partner for us, uh, and the YMCA. So just to quickly return to this slide, you'll note that for our group program, which is what I just finished speaking about, it's really only right now appropriate for the four to 12 year olds. So what that means is that for our teens are automatically in this category, and we're really, up to now, have just been offering them individual visits, which we've not considered 
to be adequate uh, to meet their needs. And so our desire to do something more for our teams actually prompted us to do a needs assessment. So we interviewed 33 overweight and obese adolescents in our clinic, and we asked about barriers and facilitators to healthy eating and physical activity. We also asked about adolescents' preferences for programs to promote healthy eating and physical activity. And we came up with some pretty interesting results. So the adolescents described significant barriers to physical activity, um, and particularly to doing the kind of programs that they wanted to be doing. So cost was a huge barrier, and a lack of age-appropriate or desired programming in their communities was also a big barrier. There were also age restrictions. So for example, for an adolescent who wanted to join the gym or engage in certain um, programs that they had to be um, 16 or in some cases 18. Also, not, maybe not surprisingly for adolescents, they always think they know everything. They perceive themselves as knowledgeable about nutrition, and they did understand a lot of basic nutritional concepts, but they also had a lot of misconceptions. Um, and interestingly, they had a strong desire for cooking classes, which was somewhat surprising to us. Uh, Fitbits, uh, physical activity opportunities, and they wanted to receive information by a text message. Um, so this background and these results um, led us to work with some community partners um, to create a new program which we've just been piloting over the past few months. And so we're calling this the Healthy and Fit Team Program. It's a pilot program in collaboration with the San Francisco YMCA and 18 Reasons, which is a local community-based organization that offers uh, the Cooking Matters cooking curriculum. So we recruited overweight and obese adolescents from our clinic, and they are receiving twice weekly physical activity, so their choice is dance or strength training. They were given a Fitbit. Uh, they're doing weekly cooking classes, which incorporates some nutrition messaging as well. And we're also sending them three motivational plus educational text messages per week. So we're just getting started with this program, but we're, we're excited to do some evaluation, see what our impacts are, and hopefully to continue partnering to expand and grow the program. Um, so while I've mentioned some approaches that we're taking to obesity treatment, I'm sure for this audience we all know that prevention is better than cure. Obesity is difficult to treat, um, and unfortunately we rarely get kids who are overweight or obese back to a normal BMI, although we can certainly improve their BMI. Uh, so I would argue that um, in order to be successful, we need to start very, very early in life. Um, and I'm going to try to briefly make the argument for you all before I conclude that um, we actually probably need to start this early in life um, in infancy. So why begin obesity prevention in infancy? So there's good data to suggest that rapid weight gain in infancy is associated with childhood obesity. So something is already happening in that infant period. Uh, we also know that obesogenic behaviors start in infancy, um, and there's a high prevalence of obesity in preschoolers. So in a San Francisco cohort study of Latino children, by age three, 44% were already overweight and 21% were obese. So if we are starting at you know age three or four or in school age, we kind of miss the boat. Um, we actually need to go further upstream. We also find that parents of infants are typically open to education about their infant's health, and they have lots of contact with the healthcare system and also with the WIC program. And there are two published studies of obesity prevention interventions starting in infancy that have led to lower child weight at age one and two. Um, so this kind of background has led to the creation of the Strong Futures or Fukuda Fuerte study. Uh, this is a pilot randomized controlled trial based in pediatric primary care. Latino infant parent dyads are recruited just after birth and followed for two years, and parents receive education on obesity prevention topics from a lay health ed educator just after their well child visit. Parents also will be receiving two text messages per week until 15 months and one text message per week until age two. I can't share any results yet, unfortunately, as we actually have just started enrolling for the study. We have about 15 babies enrolled so far, but um, please stay tuned. Uh, and this just shows you some of the intervention topics uh, that we cover, which actually overlap quite a bit with uh, a lot of the content from our group program, maybe not surprisingly. Uh, so just to summarize, childhood obesity is treatable, but it requires intensive and sustained intervention. And for that reason, I would argue that prevention is always a better option. From our clinical experience and from the literature, we know that Latino parents are motivated to learn how to address childhood obesity, but they face numerous structural barriers. 
Uh, and we believe that leveraging both community and health systems resources is critical, particularly for low-income families. And finally, I would just say that meeting families and teens where they are is a key element for success. And by meeting people where they are, I mean trying to respond to participants' needs with respect to timing and location, and also taking a flexible, flexible and individualized approach. So if something doesn't work for a particular family, try something different. And expecting that people may come in and out of intervention due to competing priorities. Uh, so it's helpful to continue to remain open and encourage reengagement when families are ready and able. Uh, so that's all I have, but thank you so much um, for listening, and I would be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, we'd like to open the webinar up to questions at this time. We only have a few minutes, but we do want to try to take as many questions as we can in those few minutes. You can either type your question in the chat box or uh, uh, in the question and answer session, and we will read them for panelists. I did notice that Sandra has been answering some of the questions that have come through the Q&A, so I appreciate that. Um, so we will be looking for those questions at this time. Uh, yes, uh, Susan, we will be uh, providing PowerPoints via email, and we'll be also showing uh, a slide from Dr. Fernandez Alicia here in a few minutes um, of her resources that she had asked us to, if she could uh, share again. Dr. Beck, there's a question for you around uh, who designs the text messages for your pilot projects? Um, oh, well, myself, um, so for our team program, um, we we did it as a group. So myself, the other providers, and our coordinator, who actually had done all of the team interviews, um, and then we got some feedback from some of the teams. Um, for, for the infant study, uh, started with myself. Alicia is actually one of my research mentors, so um, she provided a lot of guidance. Um, and then we went through an iterative process of getting feedback. Um, from, from mothers from the um, target population for the study on wording, translation, um, kind of whether the information was clear, um, and whether the information was appealing to participants. So it, it was quite a process. Um, we have a question. So we serve over 1,700 Head Start low-income Latino families in North uh, San Diego County. Can a county representative um, present on health? disparities. Great. Have there been any efforts to include mandatory curriculum on reading food levels at uh, food labels at the elementary school level? Around education, uh, mandatory around reading food level labels at the elementary school level. I can take that. Uh, Thank you. Um, I, I don't. I can sort of take it. In that I, I don't know. I don't know that um, that that has been. Uh, I don't know whether or not there's been um, those initiatives. But what I can tell you is that the way other places are going, in uh, with large proportion of the population having fairly low health literacy, is to avoid trying to focus too too much on the education and more use um, packaging. Uh, uh, labels to signal the content. So that's where the I, I, I briefly mentioned that in Chile, for example, they have uh, the the green uh, the, uh, red stop sign, yellow stop sign, and a green stop sign to indicate the overall level of healthiness of a particular um, packaged product. So I do think at the same time it would be great if more people could learn to use read uh, food labels. But that's going to be a, a high uh, push. Thank you, Alicia. All right, it looks like we do have one more question. Is there data concerning the Hispanic population and obesity in terms of language spoken at home and generation of residency in the U.S.? Yes, there is. Um, it, Latinos, it used to be that Latinos who spoke Spanish at home uh, were less likely to be obese than the second generation people who did not. And, um, and but now, uh, and that obesity increased with the generation. But now we find that it tracks very closely with wealth, that the first generation is coming in much more obese because of changes in the source country. 
then the obesity levels go up with a first generation born in the United States if they're born into a family that is not wealthy. And then obesity levels go down in the third generation. So it is complicated, but the easiest way to think about it now is less of being about acculturation and more about being about wealth. Thank you, Alicia. That's a great answer. I don't want to keep people past time, so we are at our limit here. Um, once again, I'd, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Sandra, Alicia, Amy, for your time and your excellent presentations and your um, generosity to uh, donate your time. Uh, this webinar, once again, has been recorded, and you'll be able to uh, view it on the uh, San Diego County Childhood Obesity Initiative's YouTube channel. Uh, we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording uh, in the coming days. And once again, I appreciate everyone who presented and attended the webinar, and we look forward to continuing uh, this dialogue with our partners. Uh, thank you, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Memorial Day weekend.